threads from where we were before. Um, I've got one question that I'd like to get Pippa's view on is perhaps useful to get her perspective in particular as someone who's been an active researcher in astronomy and continues to follow advances in that field but now with the, the broader perspective of, of a writer and I guess it'd be interesting to get her views on areas of astronomy the world that she knows and astronomers that she knows that aren't really yet seen anywhere in literature you know okay you've got novels about Galileo you've got ideas about even modern astronomers but what bits of astronomy are out there in the research community which just are completely off the radar of the literary sphere? Uh, it's, uh, it's a nice question. So not only what has been written about, but what hasn't been written about. Um, so I think one of the obvious uh, sort of gaps in, uh, in literature is about uh, astronomy that isn't optical astronomy, that isn't uh, constructed uh, around images of the night sky that we can easily imagine. Uh, and I think there's, there's, there's probably uh, an obvious reason for that. In, in my novel, uh, the, the whole plot basically turns around a single image of two galaxies and whether or not they're connected. And that, I chose that because it was easy to describe to the reader and it was easy to describe to someone who doesn't necessarily have a background in this stuff. They can visualize these two galaxies and they can, they can, they can see that image in their mind's eye. It's going to be much more difficult to describe to the reader uh, a sort of um, uh, radio astronomical data or X-ray astronomical data which inherently isn't visual until you kind of transform it into an optical image. So it's going to be very difficult to do that. It's also very difficult to explain theory. Um, I think nearly every single example we've looked at has been constructed around observational astronomy, around people who actually look at the sky and take an image of the sky or take information from the sky. It's, I can't think of a single example of a book that's been constructed around a theory, of a theory, around someone who sits and stares at a computer or a bit of code or an equation all day. Because that is going to be just so much more difficult to describe to the non-specialist reader. Um, I'd like to see someone uh, uh, sort of give, give it a go. Can, can you think of any examples? <laughs> from, from, from written um, fiction, probably not. I suppose an example that springs to mind from the very recent past, and I had the great um, opportunity to talk about this in a BBC Stargazing Live event that was in March, was Interstellar. And um, Kit Thorne, sort of renowned astrophysicist that's, uh, um, I suppose, right up there, at least within the physics community with people like Richard Feynman, or even Einstein for that matter, but you know, he's not that broadly known outside of the scientific circles. Maybe a little better known now because he was exec producer in Interstellar and was given the job of making plausible the character played by Michael Caine as the sort of you know, wise old um, mentor of, of the, the, the young genius who finally cracks this great mysterious plot. I better not give too much away in case you haven't seen the movie yet. But the point is, there really are scenes in that film where you see people scribbling furiously on blackboards. And it's not that often that people even do that these days as theorists, because most of the time you're just, you know, fighting with your laptop to, to get the codes to run. But certainly that combination of theory and computation is a little bit harder to convey um, than looking through a telescope, you know, the sort of traditional view of, uh, of astronomers is, is doing that whether they be, you know, Harry Potter or, or, or the real thing. Um, I guess the other area um, that that makes me think of is, well, you know, Kit Thorne um, has been involved, continues to be involved in um, a big project that I myself am involved in and many others at Glasgow University is searching for gravitational waves. So even beyond the x-rays and radio that Pippa mentioned, there's new windows in the universe opening up that, you know, we haven't even found for real, never mind seeing in fiction. Um, so the other aspect that I think maybe literature hasn't yet explored as, as much as it could is that what goes with that is that many areas of astronomy are now done by very large global collaborations. And that means that the sort of um, fictional 
device of, you know, the lone genius who looks through his telescope and, or she looks through the telescope and discovers something quite remarkable. It's not like that. I mean, often discoveries are now made by committee and it's a very different beast. There's a book which is not fiction, but it's a very interesting kind of biography of a large scientific collaboration. It's called Gravity's Ghost and it's been written by a sociology professor, um, Harry Collins, from Cardiff University, who basically followed our gravitational wave collaboration around, you know, chatting to people in the bar after a conference and getting the real lowdown of what we all thought. And he captures really well just that different dynamic of how things done as part of a large group are very different from that, you know, lone scientific endeavour that's maybe more common in literature. That's right. Um, yeah, I, I think that'd be, that, that's a comparatively recent change, I think, in the subject. When we were students back in the 90s, it was still very much the sort of the, the lone figure doing this work, or maybe a collaboration of uh, two, two or three people, a very small group. And now it's hundreds, if not thousands, of people working on these experiments. So how, how does that change the nature of the work? And what does it feel like to be part of that endeavor? Um, to be uh, uh, sort of like a, a small cog in a big wheel or to have to manage that and have, spend like 99% of your life just doing the, the management as opposed to the actual science. And yeah, I think the fiction has, has some way to catch up on that. Um, but I think with, with all the, I think with astronomy and, and also perhaps physics research too, it's uh, the, part of the challenge in writing fiction about it is that most aspects of astronomy and perhaps also physics are inherently not human. Um, they're inherently not human sized. So it's very difficult to work out a sort of a human plot around this stuff um, without sort of uh, uh, perhaps uh, sort of. Um, uh, and also without also keeping the science in it, sort of relating the human story with the science to without sort of like leaning to one or the other. And perhaps that's that's where sort of life science inherently is, is a bit easier to, to fictionalise because it's human scale, it's about the stuff that we see around us. Astronomy is so distant. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to sort of grasp hold of it and bring it down into our, our own lives and make a plot out of it for fiction. I think that's a good point too. Um, it does remind me, however, of a word which Carl Sagan has used a lot um, in, 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 when he was alive. Uh, in fact, I had the great privilege of going to a series of lectures he gave in Glasgow in 1985. I was just still an undergraduate student then. But he talked a lot about why it is, given all of that, given the fact that there's this disconnect between the human scale and the scale of the cosmos, that nonetheless people still find astronomy fascinating, almost on a sort of visceral level. And he would often use the word numinous to capture the sense of awe that one has in sort of contemplating the universe. And indeed he would have that as part of a broader discussion about, you know, um, our relationship to the cosmos and what that says about our place in it, and indeed even straying over into the philosophy and almost theology of astronomy. So maybe we don't need to go into too much of that here, although I'm happy to take questions on that, but certainly what, what it made me think is that astronomy in some ways almost lends itself more to poetry than to prose, because often you're dealing with metaphor, you're dealing with those deeper, almost emotional questions about our connection to the cosmos, rather than something that's sort of plot driven. You know, it's hard to build tension into astronomical observations. You know, things usually happen on sufficiently slow timescales that it doesn't really matter whether you do it that night or the following night, you know, so um, it, it's, it, as I say, um, perhaps more appropriate for, for poetry. I'm rather hoping you may follow my lead here because I know you've got some poetry with you. Perhaps you might um, like to um, just select a little bit of that. This is from Edwin Morgan, well known in these here parts. And uh, Edwin's written some astronomical relevant poetry. Yeah, I wanted to read this tonight, partly because it's, you know, it feels appropriate being you know, here in Glasgow, and also because Edwin Morgan was so uh, fantastically inspired, not only by science and space science, he, he wrote a lot about it, but also about technology, and that's something that we haven't really talked about. It's not just um, how people write about the, the actual science, it's how they write about the enabling aspect of the science, the technology that kind of underpins it. And Edwin Morgan does this beautifully in his poem uh, about Sputnik, the first artificial satellite uh, launched by the Soviets in 1957. 
the Sputnik's tail. One day, as I was idling above the earth, an unexpected glint caught my eye, whizzing silver, a perky sphere with prongs. I knew it was time for such things to appear, but this was a first, man-made, well-made, artificial, but a satellite for all that, a who goes there for the universe. I came closer. The gleaming aluminium sparkled, hummed, vibrated. Its four spidery antennas had the spring of the newly created. It seemed a merry creature, even cocky. It had a voice. I said hello to it. Can't stop, it cried. I'm in orbit. Join me if you want to talk. Beep. Travel with me. Be the Sputnik Sputnik. I flew alongside. What have you seen? I asked. Wall of China, useless object that. Continents, tankers, deltas like ponytails, collective beep, farms everywhere. Oh, and the earth like a ball, mustn't forget that, proof positive. And a blue glow all around it, if you like such beep things. You haven't always been bound in a bit of metal, I asked. Damn sure I beep haven't, he replied, colour chasing colour across his surface. I was a bard in the barbarous times, Ritith the far traveller. The world was my mead hall. Goths gave me gold. I blossomed in Burgundy. I watched Picts prick beep patterns on themselves. I sang to Saracens for a sweet supper. I shared the floor with a shaman in Finland. Good is the giver who helps the harper. I have nothing to give you, I said, but truth. You have three months to live in this orbit, and then you are a cinder. He darkened. You may well be right. But remembering Witsith, he flushed into tremulous light. We'll see. Beep. We'll see. Beep. We'll see. Wonderful stuff from Edwin Morgan. And if I'm allowed to broaden the scope of modern literature even further from PhD comics to Twitter and Facebook, certainly um, one uh, Facebook thread and, and, and Twitter thread that I follow very closely is um, Sarcastic Rover. Some of you out there might know this. It's a parody feed on the Mars Curiosity Rover, which has its own Twitter feed as well, which conveys lots of very useful science updates on, on what it's been up to on Mars. But Sarcastic Rover beautifully captures the um, isolation and desolation of, of this uh, poor robot vehicle that's been spent, sent all the way to Mars with no prospect of ever coming back. So um, I'm a bit of a late advocate or a late convert to you know, the power of Twitter as a, as a literary vehicle, quite literally in this case. But I think it, it, it is really wonderfully poignant, some of the tweets that you get from Sarcastic Rover. So if you haven't checked those out, I can recommend them. You've probably had enough for, from us for now. It's maybe time to, to hand over and see if anyone has any questions. Well, principally for Pippa, but I'm happy to pitch in if um, there's, there's topics uh, a bit more at the sort of science end or lit rather than literary end. Although, of course, you know, Pippa's well qualified to answer uh, answer both. So, hi. Uh, so, astronomy and writing are both really time-consuming professions. Uh, how did you make the transition from ast astronomy to writing? <coughs> so, I always wanted to write, but I had no clue how to do it. And I always saw writers as sort of somewhat mythical beasts. You know, I'd never actually met one. Uh, I just read all the time. Um, but so I, I started doing my PhD and I knew I, and I was working sort of all, all around the clock on my PhD for about four years or so and then I carried on with a postdoc and I was working really hard but at the same time I was trying to write something about the experience of what it felt like to, to be an astronomer but I had no clue how to do it so I was writing bits and pieces and this was a long time ago and I knew that it was going to take me a long time to figure out how to do it and what I wanted to write about. So it was really a very gradual process. And I left astronomy uh, about 16, 17 years ago now. And it was only after I left it that I actually began to be able to write about it. So that's quite interesting. There's a kind of analogy there with actually doing astronomy. In order to write about it, I had to get the distance from it uh, so that I could... Uh, work out what it was that I wanted to say and also how to say it. So it was a gradual process and I did a master's degree here at Glasgow uh, several years ago now and that really helped me on the way with my novel. But I, I took about six or seven years to, to write that book. Um, really kind of sort of feeding my way forward and also helped to get feedback from other people on drafts of it. 
Um, there's one uh, early reader here <laughs> in the audience who gave me a lot of extensive feedback. Really trying to find out whether anyone else would be interested in it. I didn't know whether writing a, a novel about a detailed scientific process would be interesting to anyone else at all. And when I started writing it, it, it was before I'd even heard the word lavlet or before I knew really anything about other sort of similar types of literature. So, yeah, in, in essence, sort of slow and gradual and long. Hello. Um, I was wondering, so there are plenty of examples of how uh, science fiction and, and writers have influenced where research has tried to go and tried to see, but I was wondering if there's any examples of how uh, research has influenced science fiction writers and how that has changed over the years, sort of since the 19th century onwards, how science fiction has changed by discoveries that we've made, and if it goes both ways, basically, or it only goes one way. Yeah. Yeah. I think in particular, a um, real good question, we'll probably, I think we probably both want to contribute to here, but maybe in particular, um, it would be nice to give Pippa an opportunity to talk about a particular project she's been involved in, which is to um, highlight um, general relativity, which, after all, we think of as maybe a very modern and quite sort of esoteric and fundamental bit of science, but it's actually been around a while. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's um, about to celebrate its centenary, but some of the ideas of general relativity still aren't really there yet um, very much in literature. So perhaps you could tell us a bit about the, the way you've been trying to change that. That's right, so that's kind of one example really. So what I did was set up a little project with other writers and introduced them to astrophysicists and physicists and we had a sort of workshop where the physicists taught the writers a bit about general relativity and then the writers went off and wrote stories. And that anthology will be published uh, later on this autumn, it's a time with the, uh, um, with the 100th anniversary. So I think there's one very specific, sort of very recent example. I think there's, there's probably a much wider example, and that's around the idea of parallel universes. And this is straying a little bit outside astronomy, sort of ast astronomy fi um, uh, physics. Uh, uh, parallel universes, it seems to be uh, really fashionable at the moment in, in fiction, and not just in science fiction, but also in literary fiction. Uh, you get this idea of uh, sort of multiple lives, if you like, um, different branches that, that someone's life might take, um, depending on whether they live or die, or depending on the sort of random events that happen to you. The most uh, obvious example is probably Life After Life by Kate Atkinson, which is not thought of as science fiction at all. It's also very much as literary fiction, but you can see the science influence. And uh, there, there's, um, uh, there is uh, another example by a German writer called Jenny Erpenbeck, essentially the similar idea of a woman being born and dying over and over again with different lives, taking different branches uh, implicitly in, in parallel universes. Um, so you can, I think there's aspects of science that might lend themselves to being more influential in, in modern fiction and parallel, so the, the multiverse seems to be the idea that is, that is kind of having its day right now. Um, I'm trying off the top of my head to think of other examples. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, Pippa's going to think, but I'll pitch in with one as well, which is not entirely unrelated to the multiverse idea, but if you look at some of the hard sci-fi writers that were um, around in the 50s and 60s and 70s, which I was, you know, voraciously reading as a, as a teenager, people like Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke, um, a lot of their great work stands up very well, but at least for someone that's gone on to do a PhD in cosmology, certain aspects of what they talk about really does rather great these days. For example, there's a book called Rendezvous with Rama, by Arthur C. Clarke, which is a great novel. I liked it very much. It explores a whole bunch of interesting ideas. It's about um, an alien spacecraft that travels through our solar system, but it's actually identified initially as a result of a network of telescopes called Project Space Guard that's set up to look for possible near-Earth asteroids. And this is as a result of, I think it happened sometime in the 21st century, um, an asteroid collision, or you know, a small one, but big enough as you You'll have seen that one over Russia just a year or two back. It doesn't have to be all that big to re really cause some serious damage. So that, on the one hand, is an example of where Arthur C. Clarke, just like the, the questioner was saying, the sci-fi actually kind of influenced a little bit the science because there has been big efforts to try and set up networks 
of telescopes to look for near-Earth asteroids. Fortunately, we haven't found any coming our way yet. But as, as the questioner was highlighting, what about the other way? What about um, science um, and the changing ideas of science resulting in changing ideas in sci-fi? So another feature of Rendezvous with Rama is that um, once it's realized that this actually is an alien spacecraft, then the scientists have to decide what they're going to do about it. And obviously, they want to send a, a human spacecraft to explore it, but that's quite difficult. And um, to cut a long story short, there's a very nice depiction of the kind of scientific bureaucracy involved, that there's a committee formed to decide whose projects are going to get cut in order to send a spacecraft to um, visit Rama. Now, that resonates a lot with me. You see a lot of that going on these days too. But the thing I really want to highlight is that there's a key passage where the person who chairs that committee um, gets really annoyed because his recently re-established steady state theory for the universe, he was going to build this telescope to help advance that. And that telescope gets canned so that they can send a spacecraft to visit Rama. Now, you know, nobody believes in the steady state theory anymore. So that's just one small example of where 30 or 40 years down the line, that really stands out to a cosmologist as quite anachronistic. But, you know, let's not be too hard on Arthur C. Clarke. When the story was written, it was perfectly plausible. And what I really want to emphasize, just to, to, to finish, is that those who are, in a sense, the um, descendants of Arthur C. Clarke at that end of the sci-fi spectrum, people like Stephen Baxter, have done a really good job, I think, of capturing the very latest cosmology ideas. Only a few years after the acceleration of the universe was discovered and led to the 2011 Nobel Prize for some cosmologists, it was discovered in 98, and just a few years later, Stephen Baxter was writing novels about what we now call dark energy and exploring some highly speculative aspects of what dark energy might be and how it could affect our universe. So I think there are examples out there. It might be mainly at the hard sci-fi end rather than you know, broader literature, but there are examples out there where novelists are very quickly taking on board the latest sci sci science ideas and, and feeding them into sci-fi. Um, so, sorry, that was a bit rambly. I didn't mean to talk so long, but it's certainly given Pippa lots of time to think of some more examples. So one slightly left field example is actually in the uh, uh, in poetry. Um, there was a very good poet, a woman called uh, Rebecca Elson, who wrote a beautiful collection that's actually um, sadly published posthumously uh, called A Responsibility to All. And she was also a professional astronomer. And that is a fantastic example where you can directly see how her research, uh, again in cosmology, looking at stars and distant galaxies, and influenced. Uh, the sort of subject matter of her poetry and uh, she, she wrote a beautiful uh, very short poem about relativity actually that's called explaining relativity um, so that, that, that's a very that's a very direct example I think more often there's a kind of more perhaps indirect link or more indirect influence perhaps that's how writers sort of operate we sort of soak influences up like sponges and then it all gets all swirled around. I guess as a, as a, perhaps another example is actually with Fred Hoyle himself. So Fred Hoyle was the steady state astronomer. He was the guy who championed the idea that the universe always was, always was, always is, and always will be in the same state, as opposed to the Big Bang Theory. And he actually coins the phrase Big Bang as a sort of rather rude term. But the steady state theory has... Uh, sort of by and large being discounted, but he also came up with the idea that life came from uh, outer space. Life on Earth came from comets, essentially. Comets? Yeah, yeah comets uh, sort of landing on Earth. And he, he wrote some science fiction about it. That was kind of poo-pooed at the time in terms of the science content, but in, in fact, it is not to, it's not ridiculous. There's some, there's some pretty good science around to sort of support at least part of that. Yeah, indeed, and, and certainly one of the key questions that the Curiosity rover and, and subsequent Mars missions will seek to um, explore is whether it may be the case that perhaps life began on Mars before it began on Earth, and there's even some speculation that it might have found its way to Earth from Mars. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? 
Okay, you've probably hinted at it already quite a lot, but um, to what extent do you think science fiction influenced your decision uh, to pursue a career in science? Uh, and do you think fiction and storytelling has a role to play in trying to inspire children to, to get into science? I mean, I should confess, I don't actually read that much of what is called sort of classic science fiction. I'm, I read probably what is called literary fiction, where perhaps, and I, I guess the things that would distinguish literary fiction is perhaps there's more of an emphasis on style as opposed to plot, uh, sort of style and sort of, um, uh, and language as opposed to plot. Um, I don't think uh, fiction influenced me much in terms of choosing to, at least initially, be an astronomer. Uh, I think non-fiction did. I used to read hugely uh, sort of non-fiction popular science books about astronomy and about physics. There was a famous book in the 80s called The Dancing Wu Lee Masters uh, about um, uh, quantum physics and how it was related to sort of Eastern mythology and East, Eastern religions. And I wasn't so interested in Eastern religions, but I really liked the idea of quantum physics. So it was popular science that really got me into a sort of scientific career. Um, I think fiction can play a huge role in um, uh, communicating science, but it's not its primary function. Um, I really like the idea that people will read my book and read other books and find out more about astronomy and about science and perhaps get an insight into how they work but that's not their main function I think their main function is to is is to, to be um, sort of artistic is to be literary works works of art having said that I, th I think literature has a very sort of powerful influence on, on us and it's something that I'm always intrigued by by how something that is essentially made up the work of fiction actually tells us something useful and interesting about the real world around us and that relationship between the, sort of the, the, the made up, the fantasy in our heads and the real stuff around us is sort of endlessly fascinating to me. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think I too read probably more non-fiction than fiction. I did, however, read quite a lot of what you know, would conventionally be um, considered sci-fi. I was also, as those who know me in the room know only too well, a huge Star Wars fan. And indeed, can't wait till December 18th, counting the days to episode 7. Um, how much that influenced my decision, it's kind of hard to say, but looking back, it definitely did have a hand in it. Um, but I think perhaps, you know, the, the, the common link that I would clearly identify, um, the fiction I did read, I liked greatly because it really powered my imagination. And, and, and I think, you know, if I'm allowed to sound terribly middle-aged and, um, you know, rather cliched, I think... Uh, the opportunities that youngsters have today to engage with all sorts of multimedia are great, but what they get out of reading a book just because it fires their imagination, I don't think we can ever underestimate. And maybe in a way that's where astronomy has a common thread. So even if you're reading non-fiction about astronomy, you're sort of using your imagination because it's so much about a world beyond your everyday experience. So while you maybe don't think about that much at the time, I've reflected a lot since, about how that must have been almost like reading fiction to you know, someone growing up reading about all these fantastic <clears throat> aspects of the universe. That's right, I and mean, I think that something that non-fiction and fiction has in common is the emphasis on narrative and storytelling. When you read a good scientific paper, one that's well written, you, which uh, I have to say is perhaps, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, is you, you get carried along by the story. It's a bit like a sort of detective story in, in some ways. You want to know what happens. You want to know what the what the authors have actually discovered. And so I think it has, it can have elements in common with fiction. Uh, and also, uh, you, even sometimes in the use of language, there are some fantastic science writers out there who have written beautifully and very inspiringly. And in fact, when I was a kid, um, one writer who did in, influence me a lot is not an astronomer, he was a biologist called J.B.S. Haldane, and he wrote essays. He was a very uh, popular, popular scientist in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and he wrote a series of essays called On Being the Right Size about genetics. He was a sort of famous early geneticist, if you like. 
And these are fantastic sort of works of art, essentially, because they're so beautifully written. He also, perhaps not coincidentally, wrote a children's book, uh, a, a novel called My Friend Mr. Leakey, about a magician, which I was very fond of when I was very young. And for years, I never realized that the two JBS Haldanes were, in fact, the same person. <laughs> I don't know my friend Mr. Leakey, but I do know some of the writings of, of Haldane. Um, in fact, I think I remember this right, that he, he was the one that said a phrase something like, the universe is perhaps not only stranger than we imagine, but stranger than we can imagine. You know, uh, uh, again, just building on what I was saying about the power of the imagination can take you so far, but a theme I've often used in talking about my love of Star Wars is that if I've learned anything since first seeing that in 1978, is that the universe is, if anything, stranger than what George Lucas dreamed up. And that doesn't mean that we should dismiss, you know, the, the sort of narrative power of, well, maybe not episode one, two, and three, but at least four, five, and six, and seven, fingers crossed. But, you know, if, if you see that as just scratching the surface in terms of what the real universe has revealed to us, then, it, you know, it can be quite a humbling, well, a humbling thing. I guess displaying my own... Uh, not prejudices, but at least my own influences, uh, I've mainly focused on science fiction, what is conventionally identified as science fiction. So we touched before on the fact that occasionally outside of that realm, astronomy will find its way in there. And I mentioned that some authors really do care a great deal about getting it right. So maybe we could just sort of briefly return to that and could you perhaps offer your own comments, Pippa, on, on how important you think that is, how um, if, if you were to write a, a, a story that explored other areas of science, how would you approach getting the science right? You know, who would you talk to? What would you read? If you're a budding writer out there and you want to write a book about some area of science, what advice would you give them to, to how to get it right? Uh, that's a really good point. Um, one of the things that I really like to explore is how scientists talk to each other. So you have the formal way of science communication, which is through papers, through popular science, and through articles and so on. It doesn't necessarily re reflect the way that the science is actually done and the language that people use in discussing that science. So one thing that I'm really intrigued by is actually listening to scientists talk to each other, uh, which, it, which is why I've been a writer in residence at various science labs labs over the past few years, uh, particularly in sort of genetics labs and so on. I'm very keen to uh, understand what type of words uh, people use, what type, how they refer to their lab equipment, uh, the, the relationships they have with their lab equipment, which is kind of intriguing, people do. Uh, and so that's one aspect of it. I think nothing beats actually going to the sort of horse's mouth and talking to scientists themselves. But also having said that, I think um, other people have commented that uh, we're going through a sort of like golden age of popular science writing at the moment, of science communication. There's a huge amount out there, and that's certainly like the best place to start is by is by reading what has been produced to sort of uh, educate people who aren't specialists, and that's probably the sort of first protocol. And uh, and so related to that is looking at scientists' blogs. Uh, again, that that gives you a huge insight into actually opening up. The, the world of science as it is actually being done in kind of real time if you like so you're not just seeing the finished product at the end of the process when the book or the paper is being produced you're seeing scientists write during the experiment and that gives you a real insight into the sort of into their minds and like we were saying earlier into the way that they interact in these sort of like large or small sort of coalitions or collaborations um, so yeah but, but doing the research it, it's it's tricky I kind of took for granted that I knew quite a lot about astronomy and about physics when I was writing my books. But I, in writing about genetics, I'm really stumped because I never did biology at school. I know nothing. Um, I barely know the difference between a gene and a chromosome. So I, I can't imagine what kind of goes through scientists' minds when, when they're actually in the lab, what they take for granted, the things that they have in common with other people and what is new and less sort of uh, explored. Great, yeah, fascinating and, well, not entirely unconnected to that, um, you know, the final question I'd like to ask is, if there's one astronomer from history, either who's been written about or maybe even someone who hasn't been, if you had the chance to go jump in your time machine and go back and, and meet them face to face and maybe have a conversation like we're having, who would it be? Who, who would you like to go meet and take for a beer? 
um, <laughs> uh, put me on the spot here a bit. Uh, there's probably, well, there's got to be more than one. Uh, it's got to be Einstein to start with, partly because I've been working on general relativity stories over the past year or so, and partly because he was such a complex and sort of, a, in some ways, conflicted person uh, who did beautiful science, but had a kind of a, a rather messy personal life. And he was also reliant on other scientists and other physicists to do his work. He wasn't a brilliant mathematician, so he relied on other people to do the essential mathematics as part of general relativity. So he's got to be one. I'd also quite like to meet uh, Isaac Newton, maybe, who's famously a uh, sort of nasty individual, just to see sort of just how nasty he really was, and just how just, just get into that sort of mindset, that sort of that that mixture of religious sort of uh, sort of 17th century religion, uh, coupled with really a kind of very modern scientific take on the universe around him. Very weird mixture from our point of view. There you go, Einstein and Newton, I think, put, put those two in a room together, that would be quite an interesting conversation as well, I suspect. Okay, um, well, I'd like to thank Pippa very much for joining us this evening.